predominantly white men um, and wealthy white men are at the moment feeling increasingly insecure about their power. And that manifests itself. You see that, how it manifests. There's a reactionary nature to an, to an increasing a kind of sense of we're under attack. And, and any group that has had privilege and wealth and power is, 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 is going to fight and isn't going to want to give it up, whether that's the, the patriarchy, whether that's, you know, wealthy white men, whoever it is. If you have power, you're going to do all you can. You're going to kick and scream if you see that wealth that wealth and power dissipating and being spread out more evenly. Hello, Clive. How are you? Hello, Eva. I'm good. Thank, thank you. Thank now you I'm for here. coming in. Thank you very much for having me. Can you talk me through the concept of the podcast? What's, a bre- what's an overview of this product you've created? So the overview, Heirs of Enslavement, is um, two people who are linked by history. And the history that links us is um, I'm half Grenadian, so my dad's from an island in the Caribbean. And clearly anyone that most of the people, 99% of the people in the Caribbean uh, were either indentured slaves or indentured servants or slaves. The vast majority were slaves, African slaves brought over during the transatlantic slave trade. And um, my dad lives in a fishing village called Guave. And one of the things we know is that people didn't tend to travel very far from the plantations once they were freed. Um, And Laura Trevelyan, um, my co-host on the program, um, she's from an aristocratic family, and she discovered um, that uh, her family owned a number of plantations on Grenada. And given the number that they owned, it's significant, a significant number, um, it's entirely, it was not just plausible, it's highly likely that her ancestors owned my ancestors. Um, and so we went back to the Caribbean to start to unpick that history and to tell a story about how that's impacted on the Caribbean in the past, the present, uh, and also its legacies here in the UK today. That's in the latter part of the podcast that's, um, that's just dropping now. Um, and so we're basically telling the story of, of this country's history, shared history with Grenada, our shared history, and the impact that has on billions of people, uh, millions, I should say, millions of people, tens of millions of people, both in this country and across the Caribbean. Um, and the reparatory justice part of it is basically the concept that you know, you've done this really bad thing to people. We can go, I think some people have a kind of perception of what bad is. and It's worse than you probably think. Um, and we did this bad thing, but then we abolished slavery and made sure everyone else abolished it as well as far as we could. Um, and then everything was hap- hunky-dory. But the story go is a lot more complex, a lot darker. Um, we know that Laura's family, the reason Laura found out is that the University of College London released some archives, which showed that um, when... Uh, slavery was abolished in 1833. A few years later, the British state um, paid, in today's money, probably hundreds of billions of pounds to the slave owners, not the slaved, the enslaved, but the slave owners as compensation for the ending of slavery. Um, the slaves were forced to do another seven day, seven years apprenticeship, which was indentured servitude. And then they suffered, um, you know, century a century plus of what was in effect brutal racial apartheid. Um, And to this day, now in the Caribbean, when we left the Caribbean, left my dad's island in 1974, it gained independence. It was left with literally no infrastructure. There was literally nothing left in the treasury. Uh, Literacy rates were were at record high levels, no healthcare system to speak of. Um, And for every dollar that, you know, these countries have pulled themselves up, they've gone into debt doing it. And for every dollar that they earn um, in their GDP, their gross domestic product, 60 60 cents of it goes into paying back debt repayments to many of the banks and the financial institutions that originally made their money hundreds of years ago from enslaving them, um, their ancestors. So um, that's the kind of premise of the story. And it begins to unpick the history of Grenada, the, the history of this country through our stories. And then in later episodes, we begin to sort of look up the legacies of that here in the UK politically, in terms of Windrush and the scandal and that generation, uh, in terms of the City of London and those corporations, we touch on that. Um, and in terms of our attitudes towards immigration and race generally. Mm-hmm. And it's, a, it's an untold kind of chapter of this, of this country's history. It's a really important one because until you come to terms with it, you can't really go forward. There's a trauma and you have to kind of face traumas down. Um, it's not about making anyone feel guilty or um, bad. That's not what it's about. 
Some people do when they hear it, but you can't blame people today for what's happened in the past. But you can hold individuals and institutions accountable for the legacies which are continued today. And, and that is part of the story. What was your relationship like with Laura while you were working on it? Um, good. It was really good. Um, you know, Laura is um, a formidable individual. She was, uh, you know, got to the top of her game in the BBC. Um, and she is, for, you know, she's a minor aristocrat, I suppose. Although she doesn't have a title. She comes from an aristocratic, aristocratic family. Um, the Trevelyans, you know, if you know your history, you'll know that the modern civil service was set up by someone called uh, well, the Trevelyan Northcote Reforms, where the, basically the, uh, the foundation of the modern uh, civil service, and, and he introduced the exams, basically stopped it from being a corrupt organisation that allowed those who could afford it to push their oldest or second son into the, the civil service and made it a meritocratic organisation institution. Um, they've got historians, they've got secretaries of state in the first Labour government under Ramsay MacDonald. Um, they're a very accomplished family. And, um, you know, once she discovered through those university college archives that the story they told themselves wasn't the story that she thought and nor her, the rest of her family. And they were shocked by the fact that they had made such vast wealth from such a, a brutal part of our history. But this is a story of Britain. Um, and our, our relationship was, is good. We're friends and um, we have a shared history. In fact, I know other people in her family now, other Trevelyan members, because it's been a group thing, um, a, a family affair. She's met my dad. We went to the Caribbean to meet him. Um, and others, and um, I consider Laura a friend, and there is a shared history there. Uh, I don't hold her in any way responsible. In fact, quite the opposite. I think she and her family have been extremely brave in coming forward because it's something they could quite happily have turned the other way from and buried. You know, when you have dark family secrets, you know, often people, rather than face them down or, or air them in public, they, they kind of bury them, mm. and they didn't. Um, and I think it's been cathartic for them. I can't speak for Laura, but I can see the journey she's been on. Been on. And I think it's been cathartic. And, um, but it is troubling for them. It is a troubling legacy because they understand that so much of what they have, the, the cultural capital we were talking about before, um, that confidence that many of them have, that air of, um, of being able to achieve anything, it's some, someone from a working class background, such as myself, uh, I look at it and I'm in awe. Even though I'm a member of parliament, there's a sense of <sighs> accomplishment and a sense of I can do anything I put my mind to. Now, I was told that by my dad. I was very fortunate. But there's one thing being told it and believing a fraction of it. But it's another thing kind of knowing it in your very being, which I think, I, I hope Laura wouldn't find that offensive, but that's an observation I've made by being around Laura and some of her family and there's now an organization called Heirs of Enslavement, which is people who've gone on to the, the database, the UCL database, and discovered that they too um, received compensation. Um, and this was, this was vast compensation. I mean, I, I don't know how old you are, but there's a good chance that you may have been paying tax in 2015. I'm not sure. But if you were, you were... <laughs> yeah, mm, we don't talk. But uh, <laughs> if, you were paying, if you were any of your listeners were paying tax in 2015 before, you were paying off the debt to her family and all those others. So people say, oh, it's the, his it's the past, it's history. Forget it. It's nothing to do with today. Well, it does have something to do with today. In fact, you know, a significant proportion, well, a, a proportion of the, of the tax that you pay was going off to service the debt that was, um, that was racked up by paying off a humongous amount of money to the slave owners, not the slaves, back in the eight, early 1830s. It was like, I think it was like something like half of all government spending for, for, for a year was, in, was, was basically spent on compensating the slave owners for the end for the abolition of slavery. And it's all been charted. And, and this is, you know, it, 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 went to, it went to a lot of people and it was the kind of, the kind of icing on the cake of hundreds of years of um, slavery and exploitation um, that topped it off. Didn't go to the slaves, it went to the slave owners. And we've been paying that off, you know, in our taxes. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it tells a story about, it tells a story about that, and it tells a story about the fact that there's now a growing demand in the Caribbean for what's called reparatory justice. Mm -hmm. And 
And that basically, you know, CARICOM, which is a kind of economic organization of these East Caribbean countries, um, have come together with this 10 point plan, which is to try and say to the British government, the French government, the Spanish government, the Portuguese government, the Dutch government's already paid up, um, the Danish government, all these European countries that powered their industrial revolution uh, with the fast profits that were made from the transatlantic slave trade. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's basically saying to them, we need some help. We, we've been left with literally nothing. We're constantly in debt. We've pulled ourselves up, but we've had to go into so much debt to do that. And, you know, a lot of people see the Caribbean as this kind of like, you know, palm trees, white beaches, turquoise. The oceans. tourists. Yeah. yeah. There's still a bit of imperial, it kind of bit of, still a bit of a kind of, it's a kind of, yeah, it's still a bit of an imperialism there. You know, yeah. going there often to a hotel resort, spending your money with that corporation and then, you know, soaking up the sun, the sand, the sea, and then flying back to the UK. It continues and um, it's extractive. And there's a lot of poverty in the Caribbean. Um, and... This is about, A, an apology. And I always think, the way I explain it, is it's not just about money. It's not just about giving money to Caribbean governments or civil society. It's about saying, well, let's start with the apology. Right? Let's have the conversation about why we need the apology. Okay? So if you have the conversation, which is what this podcast is about, about why we need to have the apology, um, you can begin to look at what slavery was like. So you're taught a basic bit about slavery and the slave trade at school still I think and I was but it didn't really explain the sheer the horror of slavery and I've learned things during this podcast which have shocked me and I'm I like to think of myself as relatively unshockable but I was shocked by it so you know people were taken from Africa um yes there will be people in my timeline on social media who say yeah, but they were sold by Africans yes they were many of those families now have apologized or a number of them are beginning to apologize but the destabilization of West Africa, which continues to this day, um, it, this didn't end well for Africa, you know. Um, and so many of the brightest and the best were sucked from Africa. They were taken on slave ships in the most appalling conditions, where maybe a quarter of those who were brought over in what was called the Middle Passage, which was 10 weeks in a literally a coffin um, in your own filth, chained. Mm -hmm. You're brought out every, you know, once a month or so. And, and, and hosed down and then sent back into the hold. Um, a, a, good, a significant number died, um, men and women. Um, Outbreaks of disease. Disease. Was, yeah. You, you know. Be on these uh, tiny wooden bunks. Yeah. And you're, you're kind of, conditions. Yeah, you've seen the pictures. And yeah. you're going to be seasick. You know, you're going to be in a storm. You're going to be tossed around with these chains on. You're going to have, you know, infections. It, you, your imagination can do the rest. So about 20, a good significant proportion would die on the voyage over. They'd be dumped overboard. This was a human cargo. You know? it, was a, it was a commercial cargo. And there were, there were sometimes, there were cases of uh, ship's captains who, who just decided that actually to cut their losses for whatever reason, they would just dump them in the middle of the Atlantic as, often, as, as happened, as we know happened. Um, they were then brought into the colonies. Now, British uh, chattel slavery, as it was known, was the high watermark. So... The Portuguese, the Spanish, the French, the most profitable form of slavery was the British variant. There were different, different, different ways of how you would break slaves, how you would maintain the mental and physical control of them. And within the first year, around about 20 to 25 percent perished, either through disease, giving up hope, um, quite brutal punishments. Punishments could be things like, for example, um, having your anus filled with gunpowder and then publicly blown apart. Um, it could be broken on a wheel. It could be maiming. It could be... There were all medieval. kinds of... It's medieval punishments. It's medieval punishments. In fact, um, the Marquis de Sade, commenting on, um, on uh, cruelty, as he's obviously specialism, the Marquis de Sade, said that, uh, that European, modern Europeans in the, in, the, in the 17th and 18th century had no... no there were no equal with how cruel the ancients could be, with one exception, uh, British, um, plant, British planters, slave planters. Um, they, they had, he said he, they were the one exception. They were on a par with the ancients for the cruelty they could inflict on other human beings. So 20 to 25% were, 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 were basically killed. It was, you were basically brought into a, a military concentration camp. It was, these were military affairs, the plantations, you know, armed men, um, 
it was brutal and many people just couldn't deal with it and died. And then once you were there, you were basically, there was a very calculated process by which the average life expectancy on, say, Barbados of an African slave was about 10 years. So that's a fit, healthy male, 10 years. So... Um, 10 years? 10 years. 10 years. That, because the supply was so constant, they, they, there was a, an, an economic, commercial process, which is if we work them this hard with this much food... They will basically weaken, um, which is obviously part of the process psychologically as well. And then you you get this much, you know, you, you could draw a graph on their productivity. Obviously, you had to beat them and so on. And then then they were basically discarded. And so they were they were basically human animals. They're not people. They're, they're not people. Yeah. They're, and I think that's the thing you have to understand. You know, we, we for, for 400 years, they were not considered as human beings. This was where the... The justification. This is where the basis of racism was established. The justification of how you could do this to other people, to other human beings. So you had to dehumanize them, and you had to create categories of race of who could take which amounts of suffering. And at the bottom of that were Africans. Um, and so that that persisted for two hundred years, and and they created vast wealth for this country. You know, it's now proven beyond any kind of shadow of economic or historical doubt that this fueled the European Industrial Revolution. It fueled the commercial um, banking and insurance systems. Well, let's in get into that, because I think that one thing that people might be familiar with is the brutality of slavery. Oh. But when we, when we get into a conversation about reparations, there's a disconnect. People don't understand why, well, what has that got to do with the modern day United yeah. Kingdom? And we were talking about it before. But, I mean, if you can take, it, take us through now. Yeah, so... So, so obviously you had the, 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 the triangle trade. So in the 17th century, when we started our colonies, so 16, early 1620s, basically in Barbados and so on. And, and so Richard Drax, a, a colleague mm -hmm. of mine in Parliament, his family still, I've been there, they still own the plantation yeah. uh, um, and still, still make money from the plantation. Um, that they, and they were one of the pioneers, one of the early kind of families that, that kind of drove chattel slavery in Barbados. And what would happen was that manufactured goods here or, you know, basic goods, trinkets, cheap things were shipped to Africa. This is the triangular trade. And they were exchanged for, for slaves, uh, for the enslaved. They were then um, taken to the Americas and the Caribbean where they were exchanged for sugar that had been made by other slaves who'd gone before. That sugar was then placed on. The fresh supply of slaves were then taken out. The hold was cleaned and the sugar put in or the tobacco, and then that was brought to the, back to, to the United Kingdom. Um, what happened was um, to be able to insure that ship and those goods, insurance began to flourish in European capitals and European countries to lend the money to, those, to, the, to, to the investors who wanted to invest in the trinkets and things and then um, invest in the goods and so on, banking developed um, at a rapid rate of knots and this helped to finance that and then the modern corporation so to create these new parts of empire to go and basically plunder the gold the the resources the slaves we start we established corporations that's how so the we've done it all over the world the east india company um the hudson bay company in the u.s the um the niger company in africa um the Royal Africa Corporation, of which, which the Royal Africa Corporation, sorry, of which the royal family directly benefited, one of the first brands to be stamped on slaves, um, was that of King James um, the Second. So it was the, these the, the, the royal family physical were, stamping. Physical. This is a brand, yeah, like an animal. It was that was the mark of who owned you. And sorry, excuse my ignorance. I didn't know that. That's extraordinary. Yeah. So be a people were you were branded basically branded with a uh, with your owner's details. So it was. not you know, I guess you know. In, in yeah, it was a it was a form of identifying you as who whose property you were. So you would do it to a horse, you do it to a cow, and you do it to a human being. It was just a, a the the way that they identified who you belonged to. So um, so that so that in effect is the genesis of the of of the modern financial institutions. That so if you go to Lloyd's, uh, the insurance, the, you know, international shipping and, and, and insurance company, they've now got or they did have an exhibition where they were trying to say, well, yeah, we did kind of our genesis was the city of London was enslavement and insuring that. Um, 
if you think about the banking institutions, the financial institutions, the, the genesis of the modern corporation, which many of us politically have issue with, because it's an extractive process. I never realized until doing this, the link between the modern corporations who are you know, busy extracting from the planet steel, whether it's oil, BP, uh, Shell, whatever, big corporations extracting from um, you know, the earth and destroying the planet. And that's what they've done. That was their genesis, except it was slaves and conquest in India, the Caribbeans, the Americas, Africa. That's where the genesis of it came from. So people say, oh, you know, why are you going on about this? You know, what about Roman slavery? Uh, what about the, the problem with that is, you know, if you can find me a bank or an insurance company that can directly trace the genesis of its wealth from Roman slavery, be my guest, but you're going to struggle. So yes, slavery has always happened, but this has, the, the, the kind of the roots of this now spread all the way into our modern economy, our modern society. And it gets even more, even more interesting because our, our constitution, the United Kingdom, you know, came about, um, David Olisaga is doing a fantastic um, documentary about um, the state, the, the, you know, the United Kingdom, the, the Union. And it, it's a construct that was made for empire. Lots of different people, you know, King James uh, the Second, King James the First, sorry, and others wanted to bring Scotland and Wales and Ireland together. But in the end, what brought the union together was the necessity for, I use the term, manpower. Uh, initially for Northern Ireland and what were called the plantations of Northern Ireland, um, where they hunted. Irish Catholics, like Fox, it, it says, come over and do this. It was like a holiday brochure. You can see it. It's in the, it's in the, um, the programme. I was very James I as well, wasn't it? <clears throat> very James yeah. I mean, obviously, he didn't have a great track record with women either. Uh, he mm. wrote the book on witchcraft. Um, but, you know, this was a brutal period. Um, let's not forget that. But um, so, so, you know, the United Kingdom, uh, the construction of the United Kingdom was an imperial project. It was there so that we had the, the people, the manpower, we had a... We had the economies of scale to be able to compete with France and Holland and Portugal and Spain. And that was a driving force behind the union. Now, although the physical empire is over, what they, once the physical empire ended, there were, you know, people needed a, a raison d'etre for why the United Kingdom existed. And, and to this day, you know, the fact that you've got the Scottish nationalists, the SNP and Plaid and this kind of the breakup of the union is a kind of real potential thing that's always hovering there. This is linked to the fact that the union and its construct is an integral part of what made the empire and why we created it. And now that's changed. The raison d'etre for that has kind of dissipated. Right. But um, kind of kind of harking back to the, the 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 corporations, the banks, the financial institutions. You know, they're still. You know, the Caribbean is still in debt to them. And not only this. This is the kind of the, the kind of. There's so many the kind of stories within stories. So after the Second World War, when the British, you know, levels of uh, a lot of people had died in two world wars, we asked people to come to this country from the empire. We, we kind of were hoping they'd come from Australia, Canada, Rhodesia, South Africa, New Zealand. But they also came from other parts like the Caribbean. And uh, that wasn't in the plan. And they came over and they helped to rebuild the, NH build the NHS and rebuild the country. And then Windrush happened, mm -hmm. which was a scandal that they were being deported um, and documents had been deliberately lost by the British government. Um, and that's why the compensation process, the scandal came out. But when you kind of understand the history of what had happened in the Caribbean still happens. The reason they came over was there were no prospects. There are no prospects in the Caribbean. I've got a half sister in the Caribbean. She's a nurse. She wants to come to the UK, not because she doesn't want to be a nurse in the Caribbean, but because there are so many limitations on what she can do, where she can go and how she can, you know, build a better life for her and her future family. So it's still there. That legacy is still there. So we treated them appallingly. They came here. Windrush happened, you know, structural racism. Um, and then on top of that, and I feel like I'm going on and on, but I, I will stop in a you're second. Not, you're not. The Industrial Revolution, powered by slavery, um, gave us the industrial capacity to then colonize Africa, colonize India. Um, the brutal things that happened there, and they didn't stop in the 19th century. You know, the Mau Mau, um, the kind of the shame of what happened in Kenya, the Mau Mau, so-called Mau Mau uprising. You know, we were using 
techniques um, learnt from, you know, from torture techniques learned by the SS on, on, on people because they wanted to have their own country. Um, so, you know, we've, we've powered the Industrial Revolution. We've given ourselves the industrial capacity to colonise vast parts of the world. We've, we've used corporations to suck wealth from them into the city of London. And in so doing, we've then created a climate crisis. And where does the climate crisis affect first? <laughs> it affects countries in Africa, countries in sub-Saharan Africa, and the Caribbean. Now, the Caribbean now is facing um, hurricanes, what should be like once every 30, 40 years, Category 5 hurricanes. And now, according to the Met Office, I think like going to be, on average, every other year. And these are economies that can barely, you know, can barely function as they are. Now, the climate crisis is going to hit them disproportionately. So you couldn't make this up. So the reparatory justice kind of program is about saying, OK, all of this has happened. Let's first of all have that conversation and let's think about why we need to apologize. OK, and when you sit down with a partner, if you had an argument with a partner, when you apologize, when you mean it. So, you know, when you apologize to your partner, you're like, oh, OK, I'm really sorry. I'm really, and you're like, they're like, no, you're not. Actually, you're not sorry. Yeah, yeah I am sorry. I am. I am. I'm really sorry. That's not an apology. That's you trying to just close down the thing without dealing with the issue. But a genuine apology is when you sit down and you look into the eyes of your partner and you say, I'm really sorry, what can I do to fix this? Mm -hmm. And that's why it starts with an apology. Because once you've done that, then you can have a conversation about how you fix things, about how you repair, reparatory, how you repair this. And I think it's important because, you know, as a country, we're going through a series of traumas. You know, we're, we're question I think we as politicians often don't ask ourselves is what kind of country do we want to be and I think if you think about Germany after the Second World War most of the things that happened during the First and Second World War had been pioneered in in the colonies either in China or Africa or India you know mass deportations concentration camps were pioneered in South Africa um, in the Boer War um, using starvation as a tool, mass starvation. Um, it, all of those, all of the, so many of the horrors of the First and Second World War were pioneered in the empire and they came back with a vengeance here. And in Germany, you know, they have had to, with the Holocaust, they have had to question themselves and, and talk, have a national conversation over 60 or 70 years about how they did it, why they did it, um, and how to prevent it happening again. We've never had that conversation in this country. Um, no, it wasn't like the Holocaust, but it was, there were genocides. You know, I can tell you, you know, I know that when the Europeans, the British, the French landed in the Caribbean in the early 17th century, there was a population of like three and a half million people on those Caribbean islands. When they left by the mid 1970s, that indigenous population was around about 30,000. So that's a genocide, you know, one genocide um, amongst many others. So we know, we know that that's happened. And yet we've never had those conversations about how we've done that. And, and now we have debates in Parliament about, you know, after the Second World War, we all said, well, you know, Germany had its conversation and Britain was one of the first countries to say, we can't let this happen again. We need to introduce human rights because we understand that actually... If you have categories of human beings that allows you to do what happened during the Second World War, we don't often talk about empire, but we don't want it to happen again. So we have to have a level playing field for all of humanity, hence human rights. And what we now have are many of the same kind of cheerleaders of empire telling us that actually human rights are something that we don't need and that we should withdraw from human rights. And this is a slippery slope. And one of the things about this story, about reparations, about the history of that, and when I was speaking to the Prime Minister of Grenada, one of the reasons we want the issue of reparations, reparatory justice and the apology and the understanding of what happened to be discussed at a national level is that we don't want it to happen again. Um, and that's why we introduced human rights, to sh ensure that the horrors of the Holocaust never happened again. Well, to ensure that we don't have the horrors of genocide, the horrors of what happened during, you know, empire, colonialism, slavery happen again, we need to understand what happened, what we did, and how it has affected us today. And I think we need to understand, unless we understand our own imperial history,
and we understand what we participate in, what we were capable of, then until we understand that, there is always a danger that we could go down that path again. And and that for me is why, you know, politically today, I'm so passionate about defend, the defence of human rights because it's a bulwark against the horrors of the past. Um, so, you know, there are it, it's, it's a real thing that really affects us still to this day. And it's something which I think for this country, you know, we, we have you know, big issues with the issue of immigration, despite the fact there's a demographic, demographic time bomb taking place across, you know, the, the wealthier um, northern hemisphere. You know, we know in the US, for example, we expect there to be 300 million people over 65 by 2050. Mm -hmm. um, there are, you know, scientists who say we'll be fighting over people because the global south births rate is higher. So we'll be fighting over these people. If that's the case, if you're going to need people from the global south to come to this country in ever greater numbers, not just because people in this country won't do the jobs, as is often said, and I don't believe, um, it's actually because we people, we're an aging population. We're not having as many children. And it, we're going to need to you know, redistribute where people are living. And that means coming to terms with the issues of racism, coming to terms with the imperial past, the legacies of that, and I think it'll make us a better and stronger country. I think we'll, I think, you know, we can see lots of Caribbean countries at the moment are leaving the Commonwealth because this country refuses to engage in that history. And I think the king's concerned about it as well. And, I and think incredibly, we don't, we don't ever get introspective about why countries might want to leave the Commonwealth. It's always, it's always a, a news story that's brushed under the carpet yeah. very quickly. We're not, we're not that popular with a big part of mm. the world, you know, because we never have, A, we haven't come to terms or apologised or, or, or kind of had a proper conversation about what we did in the past. And, and B, the same banks and institutions that kind of drove imperialism, drove the empire and the atrocities of it in many ways, the same corporations that were extracting gold and platinum and diamonds from South Africa and Rhodesia, as it was called then, Zimbabwe, um, are still around today, still making wealth. Now, this is one of the really interesting things. People say, well, who's going to pay for this? And I, I kept asking that question on the podcast. I think I, think I was boring, um, Laura, because I was asking, because I'm in the city of Norwich. That's my, I'm Norwich South. And many of my constituents will not be able to heat their homes properly this winter. Many of them will be sat as I'm making this cold. They'll be using food banks. Um, they won't know whether they'll be able to afford you know, warm clothes for their children or themselves this year. I can't expect them to pay for, you know, to, to be forking out for more reparations, um, this time for the people in the Caribbean. I can't. I can't ask them to do that. It's impossible. And I put that to people in the Caribbean, political leaders in the Caribbean, and Ali Gill, who is the chair of the Grenada Reparations uh, Committee, said to me, no, they shouldn't. But he said, the people who spent centuries brutally exploiting us and the same institutions and corporations uh, that are doing so today and keeping us in debt, they're doing the same to you. They, these are the same families, the same networks that have always had wealth in your country. You're one of the most unequal countries in the Western world. You're the sixth biggest economy. It doesn't feel like that. It feels like we're a poor country with some rich people increasingly. And he said, you know, the banks, the financial institutions, the corporations, the wealth that's in your country, it's not evenly shared out. And perhaps, you know, wealth needs to be properly taxed. And I think that's a, it's a, it's a really important point that he's made. And, it, you know, people listening to this will go, well, what is in this for me? And I think that's a fair question. What's in it is that once you understand who has wealth and who has power, why they have wealth and power, then it doesn't just colour the issue of reparations in the Caribbean. It also colours the issue of how you pay for the NHS, how you pay for public transport, how you pay for decent adult social care. It begins to answer that. It begins to answer how you have people living in proper, decent, affordable homes um, rather than homes that are there. You know, we know we've got you know, hundreds of thousands of homes in this country that are just speculative, um, where people come in and invest in properties. And so, so you begin to see how everything is linked together and what is in our interest is in their interest, and what is in their interest is in most people's interest in this country. So that was a real direct connection that, that was made by the podcast in my mind.
There's often a very um, cheap conversation, I would say, around reparations or even restitution, which is one we've been having this week because of the Elgin Marbles. Um, and it quickly becomes a conversation about, well, we can't give this back because otherwise we'll have to give everything back and that would be awful and we, we're the only people in the world who know how to display something correctly in a museum, so we must keep it. Do you think that there's um, some kind of dark intention behind that sort of narrative? That I think that... So, <laughs> you all know as a, as a woman that um, men predominantly white men um, and wealthy white men are at the moment feeling increasingly insecure about their power. And that manifests itself. You see that, how it manifests. There's a reactionary nature to, to an increasing a kind of sense of we're under attack. And, and any group that has had privilege and wealth and power is, 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 is going to fight and isn't going to want to give it up whether that's the, the patriarchy, whether that's, you know, wealthy white men, whoever it is, if you have power, you're going to do all you can. You're going to kick and scream if you see that wealth, that wealth and power dissipating and being spread out more evenly. And uh, I think those who say, you know, if you do this, where would it stop? Well, I mean, just on the, exam on the, the example of the Elgin Marbles, I mean, the Ashanti tribe, which is a Ghanaian, a Ghanaian tribe, um, basically uh, wouldn't succumb to British uh, imperial rule in the 19th century under Queen Victoria. So the British send what was called a punitive expedition, which is basically where you send ships up a river, or they did in this case. And the soldiers get out and they basically destroy, <laughs> burn, loot. And they brought back all the, um, they had ancestor worship, and they brought back all these beautiful death masks of all these Ashanti kings. They're in, the, they're in museums around London. And, um, my understanding is that uh, they've been given back. But what Afri the African country, what Ghana has said, my, this is my understanding, I only heard this second hand, is that we want them to be seen. So we're happy for you. As long as we have ownership of them, we're happy for those things to stay in London. As because most we, museums operate, you know. As, they, as yeah. they operate. So, you know, look, I think it's not beyond the can of, uh, of, of, of museums in this country and of this government to say... You know, look, we, we took these when we shouldn't have. And, and it happened in the past, and, you know, that's what happened. And, but we can write that now. And in many ways, it's so reflective of the um, reparatory justice issue. It's about saying something happened that was clearly wrong in the past. We're not responsible for what happened then, but we are responsible for what we do now. So let's come to a settlement. On the Elgin Marbles... Let's give ownership back to Greece, but let's say, you know, if we take this step towards you, what will you do? And so they will say, well, no, we'll make sure that where they're currently exhibited always gets a priority in terms of when they're moved around and so on. So I, I think... It's context, isn't it, as well, isn't it? So when you're talking about displaying certain artefacts that might have been taken and we might be displaying them here now, it's not about rewriting the history to say Britain feels incredibly guilty about doing this. It's about offering the visitor context around how they were acquired. You're, you're so right. And, and that, that kind of leads us into kind of the Colston statue, which I mm. think is a, is a classic case here. So the Colston statue, uh, a kind of, uh, it was an he was a slaver, uh, made vast wealth. Um, in Bristol and he, he then did charitable things with that money and they put a statue up to him a century after he died and uh, there are people who say you want to cancel our history no you can't you can't undo history he is a part of history but you can have an honest conversation about him and secondly let's have an honest conversation about Cecil Rhodes let's have an honest conversation about Mr Colston and all the others in our history and then we can decide who we want to venerate who we want overseeing our public spaces and their statues. It might be that when we look at their lives in the context of the suffering, in the context of what they did, and balance that out with some of the good things they did, if they did them, we can make a decision whether this is the most appropriate person to have as a statue of veneration in our city or in this place, or to name a street after them. But let's have the conversation. And that doesn't mean that the thing then has to be destroyed. Put it in a museum. You know, he's a part of history. And let's have uh, a contextual piece of history around him to say what he did. He enslaved people. This is what slavery was like. This is what it was like on the plantations. This is what it was like on the Middle Passage. This is the wealth that was created. This is where that wealth went. This is where that wealth now exists. 
but he also gave a fraction of that wealth to the city of Bristol for these good causes. There you go. You haven't cancelled the history, you haven't cancelled anyone, but you've told the story of Britain in all of its complexity. Um, and I, you know, I think, I think that's, a, that's a more honest and truthful way to approach things, and it makes us, allows us to understand who we are and who we want to be as a country, you know, acknowledging our past and allows us to kind of think about the present and what we want to do in the future. Um, it is complex. I, I completely accept that. I mean, before I went on to a TV programme once, um, someone said to me, but Clive, a producer was talking to me, but, but you do realise, you know, Britain, you know, you, you're talking about, you know, the empires, if it's all bad. Britain built the railways in India. They built the railways in India. And that arguably gave India the, the leg up that it needed to industrialise at the rate that it has and to lift, you know, millions of people out of poverty. And I said, I said, of course it did. But here's, this is why it's, this is why there are two sides to this story. Britain didn't build the railways in India for the benefit of the Indians and India. It built the railways to extract mm -hmm. vast wealth cotton, gold, spices, it sucked trillions. I mean, Indian, Indian economists have estimated it's something like 47 trillion or 42 trillion dollars or something. I don't even something. know what that, I don't know what that means. It's, it's, a, as, it's a figure beyond yeah. kind of our comprehension, but it was vast wealth. And, and, and so, yes, at this, we can say Britain built the railways in India, which led to India industrialising and lifting millions of people out of poverty. That is true. But at the same time, it's also true that Britain did not build those railways in the interest of India. It built it in its own self-interest to extract wealth from a colonial conquest. Now, yeah, um, well, that introduces the question of why why would you need to omit that piece of information? So this is a <laughs> so one of the things that happened at the end of, of, of the Second World War, with the breakup of the British Empire as it began to, to kind of dissolve. For some people, um, this was a, disa a disaster. And we talked earlier on about how that kind of built the United Kingdom, how the necessity for empire helped construct and formulate the United Kingdom. Um, after the Second World War, there was a kind of deliberate forgetting. After the end of it, as the empire began to break up, there's a deliberate forgetting. And I've got some ideas about why I think this happened. There's a... a, a quite infamous or famous infamous politician conservative politician called Enoch Powell uh, who gave the, the the river Tiber the rivers of blood uh, speech and he was a kind of open ardent racist mm. um, and you know they had quite a resurgence in recent years oh well, yeah I mean Nigel Farage is... was a big fan of his you know it's you know these are Nigel Farage is the inheritor of this tradition and uh, in 19... Uh, 48, he wrote in his, one of his diaries how he wandered the streets of London completely in a daze when he heard news that the, uh, India, India was getting um, self-rule. It was going to be um, no longer part of the, of the British Empire in 1948. And he couldn't, he couldn't take it in. He worked there as, a, as, intelli as part of the intelligence network for the, for the British in India. And he wandered the streets of London in shock and daze. And he came out with this quote, Britain without an empire is like a head without a body. He was committed to the empire. And yet when you come to 1965... Can you say that one more time? Yeah. Britain... Britain without an empire is like a head without a body. Gosh. So, so, so you know, the raison d'etre... And, and, and there was a truth in that. Like the raison d'etre of Britain, United Kingdom, mm. it was in many ways. But, it, so, but by 1965, in, in one of the books that he wrote, he was a part of this movement that was saying empire never empire was a nothing it was no big deal in fact most of the colonies that we had let were, were landed on us it was not that significant what's more important is the kind of immaculate conception of british constitutional democracy from magna carta all the way through to uh, the modern day this was it's almost a kind of um it was, it was almost a natural, organic progression of which the empire played no part. And they wanted to forget about empire. Empire was a sideshow. Empire was... He didn't even want the Commonwealth. So he went from, in those 15 years, and, and that forgetting in the British, of the British establishment, political establishment of this country, is part of what reparations and reparatory justice and having that conversation is about. It's about unpacking that. Why did they do it? 
Well... It's politically convenient, right, to keep it... It's a crime scene. Yeah. It's, it, 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 there is, in many ways, it's a crime scene. And what you've done, you realise in the post-war human rights world that, you've helped that your country's helped construct, the empire becomes very inconvenient. And that history becomes very inconvenient about the story you want to tell yourself. But also, for another reason, because people in this country, they want to tell the story. Now, Enoch Powell was the first member of parliament to embrace what we call, what we would call Thatcherism, neoliberalism. Because he saw what it was about. Whilst we were giving up the physical occupation of empire, we were going to use those corporations, uh, that banking and those financial institutions, and the codified international system of property law and who owns what. We were going to use that to maintain the extractive capacity. Which is why Margaret Thatcher so enshrined the city of London. It, it was always the, the jewel in the crown, so to speak. And what he understood was that, that those, those, the IMF, those neoliberal institutions, would enable Britain, the West, to continue through those corporations, as they'd always done, to continue, and banking institutions, financial institutions, to continue to suck wealth into this country. But also more importantly, with the rise of trade unions, with the rise of the state, you have to, you don't want, pe you want people to think that people who are wealthy are wealthy because of their own capacities these are the people who've the bucky pioneers who've gone out and innovated and done this not that the wealth has been handed down mm -hmm. to a small group of family and networks and institutions and banking and financial organizations that's not convenient you want it to be i'm wealthy because i work for it because i'm smarter than you and but that's so the story the history of empire had to be forgotten and it was and so we've told ourselves this story plucky britain that had a kind of empire but kind of wasn't that important um but actually and actually we actually the ones who kind of enforced you know abolished slavery and tried to stop others from doing it we're actually the good guys in this uh, and we don't want anyone in this country british people to really know where wealth who has wealth where that wealth has come from um and in fact we're going to create these things called overseas territories like the cayman islands the Virgin Islands, which are still British own, uh, 13 of them, and we're going to allow them to become tax havens so that the wealth that we've created and continue to extract from these countries in the global south will not be accessible from pesky socialist governments, should ever they come into power, rarely, um, to tax. So we'll allow it over there. And when you ask conservative governments about the Cayman Islands or the Virgin Islands and these tax havens, they'll say, well, they are... This is an issue for them. They are that we we cannot tell them what to do. Yes, you can. They're British overseas territories. So, threaded throughout our economy are the remnants of empire, of wealth, and even now in a demo our so-called democracy, our ability to be able to to get to that wealth. So, um, I mean, it, it's I mean, the more you unpick, the more you uncover, the more you begin to realise why it would be convenient to forget about empire why it would be convenient to forget about where those sources of wealth and who has wealth and why they have it. Uh, and that's part of that history. And it's a guy called um, Kojo Koram. He's a professor mm -hmm. um, at, uh, where is he a professor? He's at University College London as well, I think. And he's written a book called Boomerang um, on Commonwealth. And he's got this concept, basically, that the outsourcing, the corporate structures, the banks, the financial institutions they were used to kind of create this empire, to extract from this empire, but they've now come back to the UK and now the Circos, the Barclays, the Lloyds, the extra that, that extractive component of them is now back here in the UK and extracting from uh, the social fabric of our economy, the public sector. You know, they're increasingly outsourcing to them. And where do their profits go? They often go to those remnants of empire to offshoring, you know, to the Virgin Islands, the Cayman Islands, or whatever. So it, when you begin to see it all, it all begins to make sense, and you understand why the wealthy and the powerful don't want us to have a conversation about empire, about slavery, because it begins to tell you stories. You, once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. It's like the emperor's clothes. And, and that's what this is. And that's why reparatory justice has, has kind of opened my eyes to so much. And I'm, I'm a politician, you know. So... Um, I, I thought I knew a fair bit 
but I've taught, I've learned a lot by doing this podcast. That isn't just about paying some money out to people for slavery. It's a lot more complicated, and it tells a story about this country as well. I really that was fascinating. <laughs> Will you come back? I would love to come back. I would love to come back. Thank you. Because Ava. we uh, we hardly touch the sides, but also if you're listening to this, you should listen to Clive's new podcast because it's it's going to sound cheap if I say this, but it's beautifully made. The soundscape is. It, it's incredible to listen to and it's actually very different from what we've talked about today there's elements but I mean the storytelling in it that you've done is mm. extraordinary thank you big and shout out to Persephonica as well who produced it did really well on that great where can they find it you can find it on all good podcasting platforms so Apple Podcasts uh, Spotify if you go to if you look for Airs of Enslavement don't do what I did I was looking for A-I-R-S the first time I did it yes I know um, <laughs> it's H-E-I-R-S Heirs of Enslavement and if you type that in Google it you'll find um, that on most, um, most podcast platforms mm. and if you're watching on YouTube it'll be in the bio thank you Ava. great thank you very much thank you